Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Building Student Friendships Across the Racial Divide. Both Inspire and Harmony host these webinars where thought leaders and educators share best teaching practices and tools to support social emotional learning. These presentations are the opinions and content of our guest speakers and may not necessarily be a direct representation of Harmony or Inspire. For best viewing of this webinar, it's recommended that you shut down your other browsers. Also, if you have questions for our speakers, please feel free to use your question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a copy of the recording within the next week. If you're watching this webinar live, you'll receive a copy of the certificate of completion from GoToWebinar within 48 hours. You can also download a copy of the slide deck today under the handout tab on your GoToWebinar panel. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Melissa Collins has been an elementary school teacher in Memphis, Tennessee for 21 years, where she is constantly amazed by her students' curiosity about the world around them. Dr. Collins is the recipient of many awards, including the 2020 National Teacher Hall of Fame, 2020 National University Teacher Award for the State of Tennessee, and the 2018 Global Teacher Prize Top 50 finalist. Dr. Collins is a proud National Board Certified Teacher in the area of early childhood education. Welcome, Dr. Collins. We also have Mr. Michael Denley. He became a teacher to make students feel valued, become empowered, and live extraordinary lives. This is his 18th year teaching, and he teaches third grade in Tabernacle, New Jersey. Mr. Dunley has also received many esteemed recognitions, including the 2018 Presidential Award of Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching, and is a 2020 Global Teacher Prize Top 50 finalist. Wow. Thank you, Melissa and Michael, for joining us today and sharing your experiences with us. Well, thank you, National University, for inviting us. We're happy to be here. Thank you. So today we're going to share a story with you and some resources and our objectives are to learn ways to foster stu student relationships, overcoming demographic and racial divides. We're also going to be exploring technology and specifically Harmony SEL resources that help support strong student relationships across any community and we'll showcase how we've used them. We'll also hear some student reflections on race and social justice as we approach the very sad year anniversary of George Floyd's death. And we'd like to look at a few norms that Michael and I use when we present. And we would like for you to think about when you have a difficult conversation around race and equity. Make sure everyone voice is heard, speak your truth, listen actively to peers, share ideas, say it now in the room, and this is a safe space. You can have difficult conversation here. And so now we're going to explore what, what brought us to where we are, our why. Yes, so four years ago, uh, Mike and I participated in a global climate change, uh, global action project, climate action project, excuse me. And uh, we had an opportunity to bring both of our classes together. And after the call, Michael and I noticed that my class was all black and his class was all white. And so we saw how the classes were very much segregated. And so we decided to use technology to integrate our classroom. And Michael, it has been an amazing experience. It has. It's been an incredible experience, not just for the students, but for myself, Melissa. I've been on such an incredible journey with you. And so one of the things that we were able to do was using some of the technology and the resources that we'll showcase today, we were able to bring our two 
highly segregated classes together and share a space where the learning was uh, intimate and one-to-one -one at times or whole group to whole group. And we're gonna be able to showcase how we really built these relationships through many different resources and ways. And we're hopefully you'll be able to take some of this and be able to do the same with your students. And as it's brought me and Melissa close, we're good friends, aren't we, Melissa? <laughs> yes, we are very good friends. His um, family knows that I'm crazy about him because we're always talking and planning about the different opportunities uh, for our students. Our families are quite close. Yes. And this is one of my favorite quotes uh, by Ruby Bridges. Racism is a grown-up disease, and we must stop using our children to spread it. It's very powerful. Very powerful. And Ruby Bridges is a real hero. She comes up in our, our presentation in a little bit. So now we're going to quickly jump into a poll, and we're going to allow, I guess, Amanda, you're going to go ahead and launch the poll for our attendees. Yes, we have a poll that's going to launch on your screen now, and you'll be able to respond directly on your screen. So how diverse are your classrooms, districts, or communities? Please select one. Mostly the same race, white, mostly the same race, black or brown, about 50% different races or all different races. You can respond directly on the screen, or if you're not able to, in the question box, we'll give you a minute or so to respond to this poll. I always find the wait time is the hardest thing for teachers. <laughs> the responses are coming in. We've had about 50% votes, so we'll give everyone about 30 more seconds to get their vote locked in. Be very curious to see the demographic breakdown of our participants today. All right, we will go ahead and close the poll and we will see the results here. So pretty mixed responses here, mostly wow. the same race, white, 23%, mostly the same race, black or brown, 27%, about 50% different races, 23%, or all different races, 27%. Thank you so much for participating in the poll. So Dr. Collins, what I found so interesting about that was when you added your class and my class, that was 50% of the respondents. <laughs> right. <laughs> And Michael, uh, over the years, we have found that there are two great um, platforms that we like to use. And one is Empatico. And Empatico is a way that you can connect with other uh, classrooms that are different than yours. And then we have uh, Harmony SEL, which we love using to help with uh, that self-awareness piece. And then just a way uh, to engage our students in an age appropriate way as they learn how to interact with each other. And so both platforms are free and they are great uh, when working with classes to spark empathy, curiosity and creativity. And Dr. Collins, I know you mentioned you teach second, I teach third, but what we are going to actually present and share is universally applicable, whatever grade you, you happen to teach or subject area. So yes. I'm going to go ahead and, and share a little bit about the Harmony platform. If you're not familiar with it, it's a, a treasure trove. And this is the general uh, interactive page that you first come to. You can see my name's up in the right corner. It's quick and easy to register. Uh, it's very well organized. It's got a great amount of resources. What I found and what Dr. Collins found so interesting and useful were the units that helped kind of chart a lot of our interactions. So unit one on my grade three dashboard was about diversity and inclusion. Specifically, we found the opportunities for students to get to know each other was very valuable to us. And also in unit two, with the empathy and critical thinking overview, we were able to really hone in on and do a deep dive on the empathy as well as reducing stereotype thinking, which it's kind of interesting that we found that we're not so much reducing it as we are preventing it. Right. And the unit three was communication overview and it was really helpful for us to find effective ways to get our students to engage with each other 
whether it be whole class or one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. The problem solving was incredibly useful for our, our classes. And of course, one that we really focused on a lot and is probably at the heart of our presentation today was about peer relationships and specifically just identifying the qualities of them that are important to a friendship and then letting our students actually build those and make those. And Dr. Collins, you're going to share some more of, this, of the resources. Yes. And um, we have used Harmony within our own classroom as well as when we collaborate together. And so what we found, our students love Buddy Up Time, where they get to work in small groups and in pairs. And then we use the quick connection cards to help drive that conversation. And so as you look on the screen, it's just showing you how it uh, looks. And so this is just a buddy up overview where you can work with community builders, collaborations, and conversation cards. And if you notice, it has early childhood as well as upper grade grades. And what Mike and I like, we like the fact that Harmony SEL allows us to connect our students, what they learn beyond the classroom. And so what the students do, they share with their parents, what they're learning in the classroom. Also, we bring in other experts within our classroom to help with uh, talking about uh, having those difficult conversations, right, Michael? And that's been very beneficial, as well as allowing our kids to have different perspectives from people all around the world. And so we use flip grids we make, uh, to make videos, and you'll look at that later uh, on the webinar. And also, we have written a Harmony Goal, where we did a kindness contract. And with that kindness contract, we were able to talk about what we want to see in the world or in our classrooms. And on the screen, you can see the uh, contract. And if you notice that uh, the kids writing, uh, they're in purple and orange. So my class signed in orange. And so what I did, I end up mailing the contract to Michael's class and then his kids signed in purple because we wanted to show solidarity. This is something that we did together. And we're now currently working on a harmony goal as we speak uh, to commemorate the death of George Floyd. And what's really interesting and what's noteworthy about this kindness contract is that we had two copies made. So one is hanging or was hanging in Dr. Collins's class, one was hanging in mine as a constant reminder of our tight commitment and bond. And each of the children, without being prompted, wrote their names next to their pen pals' names. So there was a real, real kinship that's even apparent in something as simple as this. Yes. So we're going to go ahead and launch our second poll of our presentation, our webinar, and we'll hand it off to you, Amanda. Yes, we have another poll to launch that will pop up on your screen. Respond to this statement. I teach and talk about race and equity with my students. Please select one. Regularly, sometimes, only when events happen, rarely, or never. And I see responses are already coming in. So go ahead and take a minute and respond directly on your screen, please. It's interesting. I think my response to this would have changed over the years. We'll give everyone about 30 more seconds. We have about 70% of the votes in here. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll and see the responses. Regularly, 18%. Sometimes 48%, only when events happen, 19%, rarely 12%, never 3%. Thank you so much. Back to you. Well, I would like to thank everyone for their honesty in responding to some of these difficult questions, right, Dr. Collins? Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. 
And um, this right now, I'm getting ready to share with you some ways that Michael and I engage our students. So we want you to understand that though race, talking about race and equity is a difficult conversation, especially when students are young. But what we realize is that they do understand uh, things that are fair and unfair. And it's always been our goal to bring those, bring the two races together where they learn about being empathetic, right? So here's some activities that we did before the pandemic. Buddy time, we also always got together and talked about how we compare our students. And so we look at different personalities, different styles of learning when pairing our students. And they write pen pal letters to each other. And so before the pandemic, we will mail those letters so that the kids could have them in their hands. We also do projects together. Mike, I can think about some of my favorite projects. Uh, we have done things like uh, activities such as the way we play. And so the kids just talk about the different ways that they play at home or at school in their community. Uh, I also like the one, Michael, uh, where we did festivals around the world, where we looked at festivals around the world and saw how they were different. And then as a whole class, and then we went off and my students talked about the festivals in Memphis and your students talked about the festivals in New Jersey. What did you think about their project, Michael? Dr. Collins, that project was so incredible because they often talk, you hear about that expression of windows and mirrors. You mm -hmm. know, they're very egocentric the earlier you go down that spectrum of grades. And, and my kids, we're surrounded by cranberry bogs and we have a cranberry festival. And they just assumed the whole world had cranberries and cranberry festivals. And it was very, they learned a lot about themselves and the uniqueness of our area and our region, as well as learning about your students and your culture. But one very particular instance that came up that I think relates back to this whole race conversation is that in, in Memphis, they have the Africa in, in April. Um, is it an art um, festival? It's an Af African April festival, yes, right. where we uh, look at the culture of African Americans, yes. And so one of my students looked up to me when your students were presenting it and, you know, he has red hair freckles like me and he said, why are they doing something about Africa? And I simply turned to him and said, well, why do you celebrate St. Patrick's Day? And he goes, oh, because I'm Irish. I'm like, well, they're African. So tying that culture to that festival allowed them to just simply have an awareness that I think many adults don't have. Yes. And so also we took a part of read alouds and we read one of the stories about Ruby Bridges. And we love this story because it is age appropriate for their students as it talked about a girl who was in the first grade and she helped to integrate a school in New Orleans. And that's just a great way uh, to talk about Jim Crow laws and the civil rights movements. And after that book, we invite Dora from the Civil Rights Museum, National Civil Rights Museum. And we also had park ranger Tony, I love her. And she talks to the kids about Little Rock Nine and they were the nine to help to integrate Little Rock Central High School. And Mike, I love when the students do gifts. And so we have done uh, Christmas gifts valentine's gifts and i love when we did the teddy grams and where the kids sent teddy bears to each other but i got to surprise your students and brought those teddy bears and letters to them i did a special delivery and my son was there devon and he loved that as well and we also invite experts and so the experts are really good because we have invited some of our global friends and it helps give different perspectives but during the pandemic Oh, the virtual lunch. What did you think, Michael, about the virtual lunch? <laughs> There's no uh, greater sense of community than breaking bread. And here they were making sandwiches and desserts, and they were so proud of themselves, so empowered. And yet it was just such a, a simple concept of just sitting down, creating some lunch and eating it together. Um, it, it's a powerful way to kind of build those friendships and those experiences. Right. And it also helped with that social emotional learning piece, because during that time we had uh, parents who were essential workers. And I remember I had to go take some items to one of my students. So we learned a lot about each other. We was really there to support each other during the pandemic. Uh, we continue to invite experts. We uh, continue to have buddy up time and going out into those breakout rooms, uh, doing read alouds, 
projects. We did the, um, and we just did it again, Michael, uh, One Band, One Sound, where the students uh, created music together. They learned about physics and used recyclable items to create instruments. And so we just wanted you to see that um, what we did before the pandemic and what we did during the pandemic. And we still continue to go strong today, building those relationships with our students. And, and so often throughout each of these examples, we were pulling different resources from the Harmony platform to help us with each of those interactions. Yes, yes. And so to get ready for the deep dive into the heavy conversation, because both Melissa and I firmly believe that you first have to build the relationship before you can then have those types of conversations, even with young learners, we surveyed our students to kind of see where were they? How much were they aware of? Do you want to add something, Dr. Collins? Well, with, with Michael, as we start, we always plan and we're always strategic about our planning because uh, conversations like this can be difficult. And so, Michael, the first thing I remember we did was just make sure we informed our parents. We brought our parents, we surveyed them. So if they had any uh, thing that they wanted to add to the conversation, we welcomed that with them. And then uh, we thought about a survey. So right now we're just getting ready to give you an example of how we dive into these great lessons that help us to uh, have these different difficult conversation about race and equity. And it's very important now, especially with me, Michael, being in the South and hearing those different perspectives. And they're getting ready to uh, see that now. But our goal with this uh, lesson was, this unit was, for the students to think about if you were giving a superpower to combat racism, what would it be and why? And so you see here simply that the blue means that they did on, they did know who the person was and red was that they didn't. My class is on the left, Dr. Collins is on the right. And we asked them six names of people. So Abraham Lincoln, you can see the results. Um, Dr. Collins was, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was universally known in both classes. Um, and then we got into some minor differences about Ruby Bridges between the two classes. Now, mind you, my kids are third graders and Dr. Collins is our second and we do a lot of units on it, so it might explain some of this. But what gets interesting is you get into a character like Viola Liozzo, who will explain who that is, and none of my students knew. And only, I think, one of Dr. Collins's did. But here's where you start to see where perhaps the racial makeup of the class impacts the data. So if you look at this for a moment, we asked, who knew who Brianna Taylor was? And I think it was only two students in my class did out of 17. And you can clearly see that there were far more in Dr. Collins's class who knew she, who she was. And of course, the sixth person with the anniversary of George Floyd as being one of our learning objectives, you can clearly see that there's a great gap between just knowing who he was, forget the circumstances, just knowing who he was, was the simple question that we asked. And so that kind of gave us a little bit of an understanding about how much we needed to do in my class, how much was already ready to go in Dr. Collins's class. And so we didn't focus on the negative part. We just wanted to know if they had an awareness. And since they did have an awareness, we started saying, okay, what kind of vocabulary words do we need to expose to our students, right? And so Mike and I, after long deliberation, I think we talked about several hours that night, uh, we came up with talking about uh, racism, race, prejudice, discrimination, stereotype. And so we said, okay, those would be some of the words maybe they're here in their household or around people. Uh, and so now let's think about some positive uh, framing around that. How can we combat racism? And so, uh, Michael, we, we thought a lot about it and we came up with ally advocates and leadership. And we even brought up a protester as well. And those were some things that kids or people could do to have a voice to combat racism. Because I think it is as well as to empower our students to be future change agents. And I think Dr. Collins, what we should definitely share with our attendees is that we got together 
using technology, brought our groups together and had a joint conversation about what discrimination meant and had they ever seen discrimination or racism. And it was very interesting, right? The language that we've discovered is different in my class versus your class. The word bullying comes up more often in mine and your class is, is using the word racism more. And it's interesting, just those little nuances that we find out. Right. And so surrounding all this conversation and Michael, it's been going on for years. And when things begin to happen, we hear the uh, words Black Lives Matter. And when we did our project, Michael, uh, for during, around Dr. King's birthday, a lot of your kids even talked about Black Lives Matter. They had that awareness and they also knew that all lives matter. And so I, I was glad to hear some of your students say that as well, because it's important that they understand their lives matter as well as Black Lives Matter. But we know that that's a major conversation right now with everything going on. And I'm just grateful that we are friends so we can even have those difficult conversations. And so we can try to do what is best for kids and frame it in the right way. So I, this relationship uh, that started so many years ago and how we're able to do, uh, embrace our kids is just powerful. And I am so thankful again, um, and I can just say this publicly, that this relationship now is more important than ever. And just giving kids the opportunity to be around each other, have that conversation. Because I can remember as a child having a friend uh, Mrs. Dolph, uh, one of our white neighbors, and I remember that, and I really wanted my kids to feel comfortable with talking to anyone. And so thank you again. And I think when, when we can make that Black Lives Matter to everyone, then all lives will matter. And yeah. it's an interesting conversation when you're dealing with second and third graders, when they say all lives matter, that is the end goal. That is what we want all of this work to get to. We want to get to a point where we don't have to say Black Lives Matter because they do. And mm -hmm. that's really an interesting thing to take and unpack when you're working with young learners. All right. And so uh, these are just some of the primary sources that we share with our students, letting them see how people were allies and uh, making signs to communicate what they wanted to see in the world. And I can remember three years ago, Michael, how we came up with the peace sign project. And basically it was just a kindness march. And we wanted our communities to come together and also show our kids how their voices matter and how they could create change in the world. And they were so happy when we, um, did our march together and Michael had us on Facebook Live and we could see your kids march. And um, then um, I just had, uh, uh, I just wanted to do more. And so I end up having my children lead the first children march at the National Civil Rights Museum. So Michael, this work has definitely been impactful from both classes and how they're making changes together. You know, it's not the focus of our lesson, but Dr. Collins, I also think that the learning that it is achieved through the speaking, the listening, the writing, all the work that we do, the kids learn so much while doing this very important and authentic learning. So we came up with the project that Dr. Collins already alluded to about what do superpowers, what superpowers do superheroes have? So remember, we teach second and third grade. And so the student responses were pretty much what you would think a six, seven, eight year old would come up with. And, um, you know, flying laser eyes, invisibility, uh, you know, it, it, it's, we love what we do. We love the ages that we work with, right, Dr. Collins? Yes. <laughs> so then we wanted to make that connection that superheroes are not necessarily caped crusaders, but yet real life people like Viola Liuzzo, which I'll let Dr. Collins share her story. <clears throat> And of course, Ruby Bridges, who we've already explained who she is. And we yeah. wanted to say what their superpowers were. Go ahead, Dr. Collins, I'm sorry. Yeah, I love talking about Viola, especially um, when we talk to Dora from the Civil Rights Museum and they're talking about the Jim Crow laws. And we just want them to get an understanding that white people did help with the, uh, the Civil Rights Movement. And Viola was one of those people who helped with 
uh, Bloody Sunday. She saw that uh, on TV and she left Detroit to come to uh, Alabama to help with that. And so we just talked uh, to her about the kids and letting her know about the work that she has done. And she's at the National Civil Rights Museum and my students love going to uh, her photo and just talking about her. And uh, I was fortunate to talk to her daughter on Twitter. So the power of social media. So we just wanted to talk about Viola and what the kids talked about. We asked her, well, what was her superpowers when she did that? And so some of them said she was courageous, brave, risk, a risk taker. Uh, she was an ally. And so we wanted them to say, hey, we know what um, superheroes do, but those can be superficial. So we were getting ready to get to them to think about their superpowers and what they could do in the world. And so you talk about Ruby. <laughs> And Ruby Bridges, you know, what was so powerful when we talk about her is that word empathy. You mm -hmm. know, she's such an example for everyone to be able to follow. The, the part that always resonates with my students and even with myself is the part in the story where she stops and doesn't go into the school and the, the, um, the, the gentlemen that are escorting her in, the guards said, you know, Ruby, what were you doing? Why did you stop? And she goes, well, I always pray for them and I forgot today. I forgot mm -hmm. to pray for them. And so I wanted to pray before I went in. And so every day, this little six-year-old who was being just horribly treated would stop and pray for her, the people who were oppressing her. And that idea of empathy and understanding and kindness, even in a moment like that, was her superpower that came out of our kids. So it's an impressive and a very authentic way for these kids to learn about this. Yes. And then we pose the students the question, what superpowers would you have to combat racism? Just to put it all together. And so they, we, they uh, and what they did, what we did is made sure that the student voice and choice was present in this unit. And so the students could create a puppet and they did create a puppet, great puppets, and we're getting ready to share that with you in a minute. I'm getting excited. So the kids created a puppet. They uh, showed their puppets on Flipgrid. They also uh, posted on Seesaw and Google Doc. Uh, and then um, we brought it all together, and we're getting ready to show that in a minute. But we, before they made the puppets, we showed them a video on how to create a puppet. And we posted those videos with NC Saw and Google Docs so the parents could see those uh, examples as well. Because we want parents to be involved. And so we think about different ways for that to happen. And so posting those videos, getting them to brainstorm what they wanted to create, and then they shared it on those different platforms. And so thank you, Pandemic, Google Classroom. Here is the assignment that I had where you can see, as Dr. Collins said, we had the presentation that we gave the kids as a the stu student copy of Racism Advocacy. You can see it in the bottom right. That's where we had the vocabulary of our conversations, the directions on the puppet. The flip grid was something that was great because it was given and shared among both classes. So they were on the same grid doing the same activity and they were able to view everyone. So the kids were really involved. And so this is what the assignment looked like. And we're going to share a little sample of the video. And we ask for you just to be patient for a moment. And Dr. Collins, we have to just turn off our cameras for this part. And we're going to play a little excerpt of the students' video creations. If I was given a superpower to combat racism, it would be the power to zap all of the hatred out of the racist people of the world and replace it with love. I would want to zap all of the racism of the world because it's not right to hate on another person because of the color of their skin or ethnic group. Hi, this is Sabrina. Her superpower is to bring things back to life. For example, people, the people who are dying 
because of the color of their skin. She can bring them back to life. If I were given superpowers to fight racism, it would be love so that I could put love in everyone's heart. I agree with Katie on it. No more racism. My superpower would be to see people on the inside and not their outside skin color. No matter what skin color we have, we should all be treated equally because we all look the same on the inside. My puppy name is Changinator, and with his superpower, he can change people's minds from hate to love. He can make powerful people change laws to make justice equal for all. No matter what skin color they are, they will always love each other equal for all. Bye-bye. All right, thank you very I hope that was a little brief. We had um, probably 18 more videos. So we just wanted to share a little bit with you and hopefully you were able to enjoy the voice of our students capturing the magic and the pureness of their hearts and their, their thinking. Dr. Collins, you want to say anything? Oh, those videos were touching <laughs> just to see everything come all together. And like Michael said, there were some great videos and we couldn't show them, share them all today. And so after this uh, unit, because Mike and I are always thinking we are reflective practitioners. And so our next steps, what we want to do uh, is bring in a police officer to serve as a guest to talk to the kids. We're going to have Zaid from South Africa. Uh, he believes what Mike and us believe that you can use art to heal. And so he has made a puppet and he's going to share with the students as well and talk about um, life in South Africa. And we're going to continue to shine positive stories of hope and inspiration to our students. Yeah, I think it's important because these are heavy topics to talk about, especially when you're dealing with young learners. And it's really important to have that developmentally appropriate structure. So yes, we'll talk about George Floyd, but we'll also bring into it these hero stories and uplifting. And it's important for all of our students to see themselves, both white and black, on the right side of these issues. You know, so we have to really do, you know, provide a lot of different stories to give a full picture. All right. And we're going to discuss a little bit of the outcomes of all this work. So where does it, where does it lead? When you work this intentionally with students of, of this age and you really spend the time creating the space and the, the activities for them to kind of come together, this is the magic that comes from it. My friend is a sweetheart because everything we talk about is sweet. My friend is like the sun because she signs so bright. Oh, those similes and metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> you want to read this one, Dr. Collins? People can make friends with a different race by meeting new people and see what you have in common. We love the spelling. <laughs> yes. My parents said, I'm glad you have a friend that is not your skin color so you can learn about different people. So I love how this is a, um, an indicator that these conversations are going into the homes. And when you change a home and a family, you're having real change. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Collins, this one's yours. Yes. Uh, the cure to racism is to be with each other. Racism exists because of people's skin color. And Michael, it makes me think about when one of my babies asked me, <laughs> she said, when did racism end? She <laughs> felt that racism had ended because of the relationships that our class foster with each other, right? So I had to pause because we, we don't want to <laughs> tell children's story or not be truthful. And so I said, you know, I said, baby, racism has not ended, but it can end with you. Powerful words. And we believe that 
it's not right we believe that that's why we do this yes that it will be the kids that will change the future yes so these videos we will not play but we wanted to show with a grant money dr collins was able to bring why don't you go ahead and tell dr collins what you were able what magic you could you could show yes. we received a grant from the kind foundation and so we use that money or uh to bring our classes together so we couldn't bring all the children together but we brought two of the but i brought two of my babies to uh tabernacle new jersey and they were able to surprise their friends during a professional development experience and it was all it was amazing to share that um with that community i'll hit play just so we can see the reunion but we won't hear the the dialogue yes so that was the moment the two pen pals came together and you can see the joy and the magic it was really i still get chills dr collins thinking about these and emotional we were all crying that day <laughs> this is a video that will be available to attendees in the um, powerpoint when you download it there's a picture of that reunion these were two pen pals uh, the interview that you'll be able to hear is where i asked cassidy about what was different between you and your friend and she says my birthday and then she said my color and she said hers was was teal and and emma's was pink and it was interesting because i really thought that when she said my color she was going to go in a different direction very powerful truthful words from the students and they are still writing each other today three years later <laughs> yeah they're still in touch these relationships don't end in june we're going to share now dr collins you want to talk a little bit about the or how we got focused on and i'll i'll get the video set up yes and so on last school year we had an opportunity to share our uh connection on nbc nightly news so right now we'd like to share that that day with you So Dr. Collins, that was one of the most powerful experiences our class has experienced together. And what an honor to be showcased on, of all days, Dr. King's birthday. Yes, <laughs> it was an emotional day. And um, I just remember during that interview crying. And as you can see, I was trying to hold those tears back because um, I, I didn't imagine um, that day happening. and. And when we started out the work, I didn't know how powerful it would be for our students and for ourselves as teachers. I think it's powerful when you hear his words and you realize that these kids are actually the realization of a lot of his dreams and hopes and, and it's just very powerful. 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next, oops, there we go. And Dr. Collins, you're gonna share about how this impacts the families. <laughs> Yes, so <laughs> getting uh, even more emotional. Yes, so one of the students invited me uh, to the end of the year swimming party. And of course, I had to make that happen uh, for my babies. And so what I realized on that day, Michael, not only are we changing the lives of students, but we are changing the lives of the families in uh, the communities, uh, especially there in Memphis, in my school community, and as well as your uh, school community. And so I was just excited about that day and that moment. And so what we realized is whole families are impacted by the collaboration. It's amazing. And when you talk families, you talk communities. So it's having a big impact and it can have a big impact on all of our attendees communities as well. Yes. And so for the next steps, we, we mentioned our next steps, inviting the police officer. So now we're encouraging everyone to think of what your next steps would be. What is one step you plan to take to further support equity, inclusion, diversity in your classroom or your community? And if you want to take some time to go ahead and type them in the question box, we'll give you a few moments to respond. And then we're going to end our presentation today. Thank you. Because we'd like more classes to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll give everyone a minute to respond in the question box. There was one question, a couple questions came up about families. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that while we're waiting for some responses to come in. If there are families that don't support your initiative, and how you've dealt with that or any of the challenges you've had talking about racism with students and knowing that families may have different views than what you're talking about. So there are a couple of questions about that if you don't mind talking about that area. Um, yes, so my families, they welcome it, but I did have uh, one parent who was not, not against it, but he felt that it was so much negativity in the black community that he wanted to focus on black empowerment, which I do that as well in my classroom. And so what I do to try to get that buy-in from my parents is I have a meeting with them and I let them know what I'm passionate about and why I'm passionate about the work. And that gives them an opportunity to also shed light on what they would like to have implemented into the curriculum. And so my families are for it. And right now, since the pandemic has happened and we're, uh, some uh, students are at home and some are now in the building, uh, the families were there <laughs> on the computer. They were doing the work with us. And Michael even invited one of his parents to talk to the uh, students. And I think you even had an aunt come come and talk to yes. the students as well. Mm -hmm. So we've been in, um, allowing them to engage in the work as well. I think if family members see what we're doing, they can see the, the pureness of it, the, the value of it. Um, it's very difficult to hold on to beliefs that are radically different from what your children see. And so when Dr. Collins walks into an event and children run up and hug her, it's it's with pure love and affection and it's an interesting set of questions that each of these family members had to ask is if they don't have someone in their lives who is a person of color that they don't feel this closely to but their children does do they really want to prevent that from continuing and um and and to answer the question i have often turned to the fact that the state standards are written in such a way that we're supposed to be doing this work that we've been given a mandate by the State Department of Education and our unions to do this kind of work and it's it's character building. And so it's worthy to, as Dr. Khan said, involve the parents as much as you can, honor their points of view, um, respect them, give them chances to, to choose what they would like or not like. But overall, it's really difficult to see, to come up and really have an issue when you see what, what these children are able to achieve together. 
and 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 our main goal is to really bring them together to form a uh, relationship so that when they get older and they start to hear more uh, things surrounded by systemic racism, then they can remember the friendships that they made with an all white classroom or all black classroom. And, um, and, and, and I think both of our schools, I can safely say they support us. I, I've been to Michael yeah. several times. They have helped me surprise my Michael uh, on one occasion. And so we're always thinking about our kids and making it age appropriate. But I want to say uh, this, Amanda, I think if we think about civic education and we're really thinking about bringing that back into the school rooms, not so classrooms, not so much focused on reading, science, and math, but making sure that students can defend our democracy. Because if we don't expose them to it, then we lose it and they don't know what to fight for. And so that's what Mike and us think about too. We look at our standards, we look at the curriculum, and we make sure that students understand their rights and roles as citizens. And we think about how we can do that through different projects. Thank you so much. We're hearing great responses to this question in the question box, uh, encouraging community building activities between classrooms that are segregated, even within the same school building. Uh, we have transitional bilingual classrooms and ESOL classrooms, which are very segregated just this week alone. A teacher set up name tags, making stations where they could go around and visit each other in other classrooms. So uh, others are talking yeah. about writing poems and having students write poetry about their friends from uh, different races. Um, a lot of integration ideas, and some are just talking about having these uncomfortable conversations with their friends, colleagues. Uh, so, so a lot of inspiration today from this discussion today. We did have a few questions about working with older students. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to work with older students, but they were they would love to hear any ideas you have about having these challenging conversations with uh, junior high or high school students, even, or if you know other teachers or other uh, resources participants could go to for looking we're working with older older students on this topic yeah the teaching for tolerance which is now teaching for justice is a great resource that has a lot of help in that regard dr collins i didn't mean to step on you there uh -uh, no that's one of them and then uh any a uh has put a lot of resources out there where you can actually google it and it has several resources and i what i realized too and with mike and us uh get together we're researching ourselves and so we find we have discovered a lot of articles uh that talk about how you can address race with uh all age ranges in a safe way and actually i would like to throw out there too dr constance we're both members of the national network of state teachers of the year Enstoy has a database of all sorts of literature around social justice that runs from pre-k all the way up to college with wonderful examples of great text, stories, fiction, nonfiction resources that would be a, a treasure trove and that you can easily search and find on the Enstoy website as well. Yeah. And I we, got a great, we got a great comment here too. We have an after school coordinator and she said her middle school students are going to be participating in a Black Lives Matter week ending with a middle school forum discussion on the question, how will you be part of the change? Love that idea. Excellent. That's a great idea. And I think it's important to have that conversation because children know far more than what we think they know as we're discovering uh, just by talking to them. And when the pandemic happened, uh, a lot of things were happening and happening and kids were at home and they were watching TV with their parents. And so a lot of questions and conversations are happening around the different things that are occurring in our country. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you have inspired us today. We are thrilled you were able to hear uh, your stories and, and what the amazing accomplishments you have both achieved. Incredible. And we're hearing in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your inspiration and all that you do. I did hear from one of the participants today. It's National Superheroes Day. Uh, how perfect. How perfect for this webinar. You two are our superheroes. We knew that. <laughs> do you have we any closing it. words? Do you have any closing words for our audience today? Be superheroes. Uh, yes, join us in helping change the world. And thank you, uh, National University, for allowing us to 
use this platform to have this courageous conversation. Thank you. And please stay in touch. Please stay in touch, everyone. We have our contact information up there for anyone that wants to ask us for more details or shared resources or anything. We're, we really are about making this a big, wide impact. Um, it serves all of our purposes to make this get larger and larger. So feel free to reach out to us. And thank you, National University. Yes, yes. Thank you all for joining us today. We are thrilled you were able to be here and learn about these two amazing educators who have helped build friendships across the racial divide. If you don't mind going to our next slide, we just want to let you know about our next webinar on May 27th with Dr. Barzana White, a district school psychologist in Louisiana, and she will share how SEL can help improve climate and help mitigate the effects of trauma. You can register today on our webinar page for this powerful webinar you will not want to miss. In just a few minutes, our webinar is going to come to a close. A survey will launch on your screen. It's very short and we greatly appreciate your feedback. We read your feedback and take your responses seriously. To this day, your responses have helped us make and build more wonderful webinars. But before you go, we do want to spend a minute. We did get a couple questions in the chat about learning more about Harmony Resources. So we do want to spend a minute and let you know how you can support your work further around this important topic our presenters highlighted today. Michael and Melissa shared how they created strong student relationships in their classrooms using Harmony SEL. And as you heard, these relationships bridge the diversity gap using fun and easy to implement lessons and activities. All of these resources are available to you at no cost on our online learning portal. We hope you'll visit our portal and explore which unit or resource you can use today to implement in your classroom. We do have one short clip we want to show you before we close today, just to let you know more about our online training opportunities to further support your SEL journey. Want to supercharge your Harmony SEL implementation? Explore everyday practices, lessons, and activities, or the latest Harmony resources with a live presenter. Register for virtual training sessions now in the Harmony Online Learning Portal. Visit online.harmonysel.org for more information. Thank you all for joining us today. Stay safe and we'll see you at our next webinar. Take care.